that's why we, we hear so much about people going back to do the, you know, going back to the inner child because someone who's, for example, been abused or in any way, whether it's sexual or physical, or if it's a short period or long period at any stage in, in our formative years and, 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 and as adults, um, that is organically growing. You may not be consciously aware, but you're in a situation where there's a similar smell or a similar sound or a similar looking person or a statement or a movie, and it gets triggered. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Squeeze. The Squeeze. The Squeeze. The Squeeze. Remy is looking so confused right now. Why is daddy talking like that? Why is he speaking like that? Because he's weird. Welcome, everyone. We're happy to have you. Happy Wednesday. Hope your week is off to a wonderful start. And Midweek. If not, we got time to fix that. We got a whole other half of the week to go. Um, we're going to start doing that right, right now. Right this moment. So why don't we smile? All right. There you go. It's a Even time. if you don't want to, let's it's see those time. pearly whites. Let's flex those cheek hey, muscles. Hey, you're not smiling. Oh. Everyone's got to smile. Sorry. Okay, that's not a real smile. That looks like I'm in pain. I don't like doing big smiles. Why? I just, I don't like how I look when I have a big smile. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, then like a, like a. I gave it to you. Okay. <laughs> this is going to turn into a fight here. I smiled. Me? I'm smiling. <laughs> I'm smirking. That counts. Okay, fair enough. Maybe. Um, I do want to talk about something that um, my husband did uh, yesterday, two days ago, a couple days ago. Um, that was really sweet. A few episodes ago, we ended with, um, I said something and you were making fun of me, but doing something for someone else, doing something nice for someone going out of your way to make someone stay, holding the door open for them, saying an extra thank you, whatever it may be. The other day we were meeting at the store. We both drove separately. Uh, I had parked in the parking lot and Taylor was like a few rows on the other side of me. And I watched him and he started like walking the opposite direction of the entrance. And I was like, where is he going? And then he walked over to this old lady who was trying to get stuff in her car. Yeah, I you know, mean, it was a pack of like 42 water bottles. It was one of those huge ones. Yeah. Thing probably weighed like 40, 50 pounds. Yeah. And you helped her, you helped her put it in her car. You know? Um, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. That was really sweet. And we didn't want her breaking her poor little back. No, that was really sweet. I was like, oh, mm. how cute <laughs> is that? <laughs> LOL. You did something for someone. That was very kind of you. Oh, wow. Thank you. Yeah. How's your day gone? <laughs> Deflect. Deflect. Um, if you guys, get, should we take her chicken away? I can hear it. Ram. What are you doing with your chicken? Just lay down. Good girl. Okay. Thank you. Good girl. Lay down. Thank you. Oh, that's very sweet of you, Ram. What's an episode without dog kisses? Lay down. Good girl. Lay down. Ram. Hey. You got something to say? What you got to say? She says, um, thank you guys for listening to my parents um, ramble on about their lives and things that I can't quite comprehend because I'm a dog. Okay. But down, I just baby. love the taste of dad's lotion. Lay down, puppy. Lay down, baby. Dad's moisturizer is just so good. Hey, Rem, you... <laughs> good girl. No, no, stay. Oh boy. Um, my day is going, is going good. Um, I had a psyche eval today. Oh yes, you did. For the first time, a full little yes. eval. How did you feel about that? Good. I have yeah. like a follow up to talk about some things, but okay, it was good. It was, I didn't know like what a psyche eval was, but basically he just like, yeah, I don't know either. Asked me a bunch of questions about how I'm feeling different, like things I could maybe struggle with or, you know, asked, yeah, just basically asked a bunch of questions about, you know, different emotional, different physical things that I've, um, been through and have dealt with, am dealing with. 
So yeah, it was it was really simple. Okay, well, I'm glad you felt good about it. Yeah, it was great. Nice. Yeah. Well, who do we have on the show today? We have someone who actually has been highly requested hmm. by our guests. You guys have been asking for her to come on for honestly quite some time. Wow. I had to laugh to myself because last week someone asked for her and I was like, little do they know. Oh, really? Little know do they that. know she's coming on. Uh, Dr. Carolyn Leaf we have on the podcast today. Yes. And what does she specialize in? Oh my gosh. This is what I, this is, I had to ask her this. Um, okay. So she's a neuroscientist. I have to read it because I I can never say it. She specializes in psycho neurobiology and metacognitive neuropsychology. Ooh, not going to try that one. Yes. But there's also metacognitive neuropsychology. She's a very, very, very smart lady. Yes. Oh my gosh. Very smart, very kind, but we just had a very educational time with her, which was so fun because, you know, I, yeah, we definitely learned a lot. I love, I love, um, I love learning and she, she's a great person to follow. We have her, um, we'll leave like her Instagram down below. You guys should go check her out. She's great. She has awesome tools, um, for your mental health. She recently just came out with a book called how to help your child clean up their mental mess. Yeah. Uh, we just kind of dove into. Which is great for like parents. Yes. Right. Yes. 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 Um, with kind of how to support, you know, your children mentally. Yeah. Um, very important as they grow up, as they go through trials and tribulations. Um, but it was just really awesome to get to talk with her. She has some of the most insane stories of people that she's seen, people that she's helped, uh, and just, very very knowledgeable and just has a really cool outlook on on mental health and on you know how to treat things and how she approaches it uh i learned about the neuro cycle which is really cool mm-hmm. um i don't want to give too much away because that was a fascinating part for me yeah but yeah we really we enjoyed our time yeah very thankful to have her and just yeah honored to have her on people sure. like her on this show it's very we're very thankful for everything that you know that Dr. Leaf does and you know that all of our specialists that we have on just do for the world. Yeah, because we would not be sitting here today without them. Yeah. Because for we sure. would we would not be well, we would be very unwell. There you go. Yeah. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode. All right. Well without further ado, everybody enjoy Dr. Carolyn Leaf. Carolyn, thank you so much for squeezing in with us. We are so excited to have you here on the squeeze. Well, I'm really pleased to squeeze with you. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. Okay. Before we get started, I do, I have a question. So you have like a lot of titles and two of these words, I don't even know what they are. Um, you're a neuroscientist that specializes in psycho neurobiology and metacognitive neuropsychology. Wow. Um, what, what does that mean? <laughs> Basically, I study the science of how the mind brain body connection works and the difference so the difference between them and how they interact and how that affects how we show up in life and once we understand how we show up in life and how to read that we can then track back and find out how to we can basically deconstruct and reconstruct we can reverse engineer back to the source of how we show up because how we show up is always because of behind it we don't just show up you know and when i say show up our emotions and behaviors how are we functioning in life and so we can track that back and then we can re- deconstruct and reconstruct and rewire and show up differently. So we can, can't change our stories, but we can change what it looks like inside of our psycho neurobiological network, mind, brain, body network, and yeah. therefore how it plays out into our future. Wow. Wow. Those words, that, that sounds so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> I mean, I'm just curious, did you like always have a passion for this or what what originally prompted you to want to get in this field i think from i always did from very young i was interested in the mind and the brain and wow. was going to become a neurosurgeon and i got into medicine and i thought oh, this is not really what i want to do because it's just i don't want to be dealing in an i don't want to be in an operating theater all day long and got very interested in a degree that they were offering at university at the time and i mean i'm i'm 
60, uh, just to uh, almost 60 in a couple of months. And so when I was training back in the 80s, neuroscience was pretty much not even spoken about. So they had, I was very fortunate to have been exposed to a degree that was a combination of medicine and mind and whatever. So I moved into that and that just got my, um, my juices going. And I started doing research very early on in trying to understand if someone's got a brain injury or if someone's battling with learning or from severe trauma, how can we help them in a way that empowers them to change? And that took me down a journey of, you know, understanding what is memory, what are thoughts and what is what are emotions and all these things that we throw out there and that are kind of overwhelming and what that means and how we can actually change our mind, change our life, which is really great. So it's been, it's always been a fascination and I haven't stopped. It's 38 years I've been in the field now. Wow. I still do research. I still run clinical trials. I don't practice anymore. I practice for about 25 years. Okay. And I'll just pretty much do this. And I put all, everything that I find and research and everything that I have discovered into a mental health app to try and make, uh, basically to help people have accessible and affordable mental health support. Yeah. Is this, wow. is this app out already? Yes, it's been yes, it's been out for a while now. It's called the NeuroCycle, um, as in neuro for brain and cycle. So cycling through your brain, and it's basically how you would use your mind to change your brain and body, and change your messy mind. So you can you can literally drive the direction of how your brain changes, which is incredible. Because if you can if you can learn how to do that, you can pretty much rewire your networks and change how you function. And it's not easy. I mean, it's easy, but it obviously doesn't happen overnight. Right. But it's something that people don't realize how much power we have yep. and yeah. how to utilize that. You know, so it's because our current biomedical model is very much about labeling and sticking people in a box, very biomedical, very what we would call reductionistic. But that doesn't work when you consider people's stories. Life's, life is complex. Challenges are huge. So you can't just stick a whole experience into a label. You've got to do so much more. And that's what I've what I do with the work I do. Wow. And that's what the app does. It's very simple, practical, how to yeah. rewire your brain, literally. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. I mean, yeah, it definitely takes work, but what a powerful thing yeah. to be able to do and just know that you can have the control to to do that and, you know, how it can change your life. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people it, don't it's, realize It's fun that. because it's pretty much... Yeah, no, it is. It's very helpful. It's very empowering because essentially it's mind management. So we talk about managing pretty much. That's what I teach. How can you manage your mind? Because your mind is doing all the work. Your mind is your aliveness. Your mind is your is what's helping us have this conversation. Now, if you were dead, we couldn't have this conversation. So your mind is this energy force that actually makes the brain work and makes the body work and makes your heart work and all that kind of stuff. So the mind needs to be managed. Otherwise, messy mind, messy brain, messy body, messy life. So that's the sort of very simple cliff notes view so if you can teach a person to whether it's a simple day-to-day -day struggle like getting irritated in traffic or something that's maybe a pattern that's starting in a relationship or maybe a big trauma like an abuse of some sort whatever wherever it is on it on that scale and in between we need to know how to be empowered to manage our minds and so that's really what the focus is yeah that's awesome wow that's so cool i want to know just as you were talking and sharing you know everything you've been through through the field, through all your research, through all your experiences. Is there like, this is such a broad question, so if you don't have an answer to it, we could skip over, but is there something that you've like found in your research that like was like an aha moment or maybe shifted the way you approached um, your not career path, but approached how you handled, you know, all of this mental health stuff? Oh, for sure. Thank you for asking such a great question. I think that epiphany moment really happened when I was pretty young and I was a new student and I was uh, one of our neuroscience professors was saying the brain can't change. Mm. And immediately I thought that's impossible because we're never the same from moment to moment. You know, our life is constantly changing and whatever. And our mind is how we experience life. And therefore the mind changes, the mind uses the brain. So therefore the brain must change. And I said this to this professor and he said, oh, well, go do research and go study something like traumatic brain injury because, you know, there's no point. In it. Basically it was being sarcastic and saying there's no point in studying it because in the 80s they didn't believe the brain could change mm -hmm. so I took up the challenge and that really was an epiphany moment for me because I thought okay if I can work out how to get my mind to change my brain then there must be some impact that it could have with people with dementias or learning disabilities or traumas or mental health issues or 
you know, the, the autism, traumatic brain injuries. And so I did some of the first neuroplasticity research back in the late 80s, early 90s with traumatic brain injury. And that showed me that this is the right way to go. And so I developed it further. I was in South Africa at the time. Um, I, so I lived there. I've been here about 15 years, but I was there at the time when I started my research. And that was around just post-apartheid and the uh, well, pre and post it was during that time period so I worked in a lot of the um, schools in South Africa and a lot of the hospitals and things like that and, and seeing the trauma of um, of just people's I mean that terrible apartheid system and just what can happen when there's that kind of socioeconomic and political and you know all that's bad how it affects people as a community and so I was dealing with a lot of trauma with people in, in that situation. And I started applying this in that level, at that level too. And uh, it, it was just phenomenal to see the responses of people that didn't feel that they could ever learn or achieve anything or deal with that extreme trauma. And I mean, there was a situation once of I was, I would go into the, what they called the townships mm -hmm. and I'd work and um, it was terrible how the systems they had. And I would go into a school and then the whole community would come and we'd have thousands of people that, that and I could go where, if you were white, they would kill you. I could go anywhere. I could get in my car. I could be nine months pregnant. I could drive because they understood that I came with a message of hope. So I worked there for years and I'd go in and thousands of people would turn up and it, there were no microphones. So I'd have to like stand on a, mm -hmm. like a, but the yeah. bench for something and teach the stuff. And the point is that I that I told them about how I, I couldn't fix everyone's problem, but I could empower them to understand how they worked right. and how they could change and how they could learn and how they could deal with the trauma. And you know, so long story short, that those that combination of seeing people. The one day I had this one guy. This is quite a dramatic story. It also was an epiphany moment. I was teaching a group like this, and this one very scary-looking young man walked in. It's like the Red Sea party. Everyone just moved out of his way, and he went to the back of the one of the main sort of rooms that I was teaching in, and he just stared at me the whole time. And my first thought was, okay, this is someone that when I go home, I need an escort because this is someone scary. That's how scary it was. And as the five hours that I was teaching, I'd sit there for hours. They wouldn't move. At the end of it, when the, one of the teachers or one of the yeah one of the teachers came up and said, "Does anyone want to thank Dr. Leaf?" And this young man ran to the front, tears pouring down his eyes, and he held up a pen and he said, "Now I know what to do with my pen to study, and now I know what to do with my mind to get healthy." And wow. he went. For, he was a drug addict. He was he was everything bad that you can imagine. He wow. was involved in, but he was he had such a hunger to learn that he would turn up at schools and try and just learn. He was about twenty five. And anyway, long story short, that changed his life. He became a pillar of the community, went back to school, transformed whole communities. And it was, it, I can tell you a thousand stories like that. And so it's like, it, was, it almost wasn't one epiphany, but it was a whole pathway of seeing that, you know, that if we can just help a person understand what the mind is and how you can manage it, mm -hmm. no matter what your circumstances, it doesn't mean you're suddenly going to get rich. That's not what I'm saying. But it means that within the means that you have, you can transform yourself and transform communities. And that's what's kept me going all these years. So I don't want to bore wow. you with too many stories, but oh, I mean, that's like... I, those were good ones. <laughs> those are so good. That was a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's... It's, it's so cool what you do because, um, I mean, myself included, like a lot of us just feel like I don't... Like I don't... I'm like not thinking I'm capable of changing how my mind works, not thinking I'm have the right tools or I need to, you know, go do all these classes on bettering my mental health or something, or go spend all this money on different types of therapies. But yeah. really it is like, you make it such an accessible thing for everyone of any, yeah. any sort. So it's really awesome that also awesome. And just really encouraging. Like it made me think of when you were talking, um, we got our brain scan at the beginning of the year and mine, I had, my therapist had told me that I had PTSD, but my brain scan proved and showed me that I did have it. And honestly, knowing it and like knowing that like I could change it, like that the power was in my hands to like change it was really empowering. And like, yeah, it just, I don't know, like just learning about how, how these things work and that, that we have the power to change them is just, is really cool because a it lot of people it. don't realize it. 
No, they don't realize it. And it, it seems, you know, with the current biomedical model, it, it almost feels like, well, that's it. I'm a broken brain. That's all yeah. I am. Or yeah. I've got this, you know, this genetic flaw or something. Meanwhile, every human being is a mess. We all have, no one has a normal brain. That's what research has shown from mm. a very famous research out of coming out of Yale. There's no normal brain. We are so unique and our brain is changing every moment of every day. It's not the same as it was when we started this, this interview. It's changing all the time. And the beautiful thing is you can direct that change. And the research that I do, and we're actually going to be building this into our app, which is really cool. You can I use QEG technology in our research, which is where you put a cap on your head, and that gives you a very, very, very good and accurate um, scan of the brain that tells you how your brain is responding in the moment. And our brains change all the time, and and we've all got like what we call the Goldilocks principle, which is um, it's sort of an, I. You know, the Goldilocks approach is just right. You know, but we've all got our just right way of functioning, which is different for everyone. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of knowing that is so great. And to see, to be able to show someone as you experienced, hey, like when you are feeling very anxious, this is what it looks like. But that's not a permanent state. That's just a representation of now. And if you do this, you can change. So a lot of the the, the research we do, psychoneurobiological research, we'll look at someone's story what's going on in your life. We'll do various self-regulation scales and psychological scales to get those, you know, there's a whole psychology side. So that's the psych side. Then we'll look at the brain, neuro, and we'll look at how, in as you tell your story and, and, and so on, what does it look like in your brain? And then we'll also look at the biology. So in other words, what's happening, for example, in your telomeres? And I don't know if you know what a telomere is. But I can explain it very simplistically. I do not. <laughs> I cross my, okay, so a tele, if I cross my fingers like this, this is a really simple example. My nails would be the telomeres. This cross is a chromosome, and chromosomes unwind into our DNA. So in the cell, we've got our chromosomes. Mm -hmm. We've got 23 sets, and the end of them, we've got our um, telomeres, which are nails. So now your nails can break, telomeres can break. And telomeres are very important for the ability of, of um, cells to divide. And, and when cells divide, they make new cells and cells make your body. So your telomeres tell you a lot about your biological health. And what we ideally want is for your biological health to match with your chronological age. So I'm 60. So ideally, I want to have a body that's 60, but actually I want it younger. My, my biological age is about 12 years younger than my actual physical chronological age and I really attribute it to my management so forget about me but look at our research for example we've had people that when we when we look at this combination and people that have come into the study where they have so much they, they can't function they're so depressed they're suicidal they've been multi a multiple diagnoses, polypharmacy, which means multiple different drugs, tried everything, life falling apart. I mean, really extreme states. And then we've had others that have been, you know, maybe not as bad, but are battling as well. And and because everyone battles, there's no one who's excluded. It's totally normal to be a mess. Okay, as I said in the beginning. Long story short, if we take them through a process of mind management over a period of time. And I can tell you the details of the time and the and how you do the mind management in a moment, if you would like me to explain, I can with pleasure. But essentially what we see over time is that people, they would, just one case study is coming directly to my head. This person was in their mid thirties and totally like really everything flatlined, depressed, couldn't sleep, wanted to give up on life. They were kind of persuaded by a friend to come into the study and they'd done everything polypharm every drug therapy you can imagine and um within within three within nine weeks their biological age had increased by 35 years so what that meant was that day one they they were 30 in their mid-30s but their body was of a sickly 65 year old a lot wow. of inflammation physically had a really bad so telling me is very short not healthy life just they were saying i am depression my life's over that kind of thing by the uh, by day 63, which is nine weeks later, which is the time frame that our psychoneurobiological networks work with to make changes that will actually impact your life. Okay. Within nine weeks, that person was saying, I'm not scared of depression. I'm not depression. I'm depressed because of, and it turned out that they'd had years of terrible childhood sexual trauma. And that's so the coping mechanism was suppression, but you can't suppress it because eventually it would explode, which it did. It exploded yeah. in their sort of teens and so on. Long story short, they in within within nine weeks of mind management, every biological measure that we did, including telomeres, showed that they had in, gained 35 years of biological health. 
and felt that they, they had a sense of peace. They knew it. They were sad and grieving what they'd gone through and depressed and anxious because of that. But that's normal depression, normal anxiety. Of course, you're going to grieve yeah. if you think of what you lost. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's that kind of thing. And we do a lot of that. We've got a lot of studies going. We've got a big study running at the moment on this whole time frame thing. And I mean, it's fascinating the sort of changes that we see. So. So, I mean, sorry, I can go on forever about this stuff. Because I want to do this test. Give people... <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> You're like, how do I sign up? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I don't want to know. Amazing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was us going into our, our brain scans. I was like, I'm pumped. And Taylor was like, I do not want to go. Yeah. He only did it because he's a nice husband and did it for yeah. me. Oh, right. it's, it's, very... you know, it's, that's that's where you want to go in and make it nice and easy. So we're going to be building that into, the, into our app as well. So you can do it in your own home and you can wow. do you know which is nice and you know calm and that kind of stuff so okay but in the but in the you don't even have to do the scan i mean the evidence is there this is the beauty of science that that um the system that i've developed when you do it that's the sort of thing that's going to happen yeah you know that's the sort of thing you can expect you're going to but the biggest thing is not even so much what your brain looks like and what your body feels it's what how do you how are you functioning how are you feeling like you are you giving yourself permission to be sad and to be anxious and depressed and because those are very normal if you think of a scale and you know those old fashioned scales where you've got two little plates and a yeah. balance beam in the middle and you put weights on and they go like this but if you think of all of life's experiences and all the emotions this could maybe be the things like depression anxiety etc this is all the you know happy stuff okay we want a balance of the two. We have, to be a whole person, we need both. And essentially what's happening as we go through life is that we have these challenges. And so we need depression and anxiety to help us understand the challenge. So depression and anxiety aren't illnesses. They are telling us something. So if we embrace them as a message, we can actually say, okay, I'm not depressed because I'm depression. I'm not depressed because I'm mentally ill. I'm depressed because there's something going on. So, you know, why am I depressed? And you can go through a process where you can actually rewire the network. And so then depression then works for you, not against you. But if we do, and that's mind management. If you don't manage your mind, that depression, which is, and that stress and all that stuff that we think is bad is actually good for you. But if you don't manage it, it can tip and then the scales tip and then it works against you. And that's when people go into extreme states and so on. But even then you can help someone get back up. And you yeah. were saying earlier on, Taylor, that about the child, the, the the sort of idea of being empowered constantly. If you think of it, you wake up with yourself at three in the morning. You know, yes, you're lying next to each other, but let's say you're having a panic attack where you're on the road driving somewhere. You, 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 you manage, you, you don't, you're not with your therapist all the time. You're not with each other all the time. You're not with mm -hmm. a counselor all the time. Yeah. You're with yourself all the time. Your mind is driving everything. So if we don't know how to read the signals of where we're at and how to keep ourselves under control, things just get out of control. And that's yeah. essentially what we can learn to do. Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. Okay. So I am the one that does the laundry. But Boy Tay, obviously, we know does the cooking. Um, I do the laundry in the house. Sometimes I do have Boy Tay do the laundry. But he gets a little confused with how much detergent to put in it. Yeah. You just have a lot of specifications. Yeah. I feel like you never know how much is, you know the correct amount uh, what to put because it's kind of confusing there's a lid and you this giant jug of detergent and you pour yeah. it and you're trying to figure out how it's much yeah well i have a solution for you honey hmm. earth breeze okay yes basically earth breeze is laundry detergent that looks like a dryer sheet oh it's sheets of laundry detergent that go in the washer fully dissolve hot cold whatever temperature what? you have it at there's no mess there's no measuring no heavy lifting, those heavy jugs. It's literally just wow. makes life so much easier. No stressing about how much detergent to put in. Yeah. Just take a sheet, put it in. Half load, half a sheet. Full load, a full sheet. Throw it in. Why hasn't this been done I until know. now? Thank yeah. you, Earth Breeze. Yeah, I know. And you still get the same powerful clean. Still fight stains, odors. Works. Wow. Yeah. So they're just sheets. They're just sheets. It's great. Okay, I can yeah. do this. Yeah, you can. There's, I can do this. You can. I have faith in you. And there's no reason for all of you listening to not to make the switch. Yeah. Right now, our listeners can subscribe to EarthBreeze to save 40%. You can go to earthbreeze.com slash the squeeze to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash the squeeze for 40% off. Go check them out. Earthbreeze.com slash the squeeze. Thank you, EarthBreeze. I owe you dinner. Okay, you posted something on your Instagram that I just wanted to highlight because it really 
stuck out to me and Taylor's going to laugh at me because I don't even know if he knows what I'm about to say. And he's going to roll his eyes and be like, this is the most you thing I've ever heard. Oh, boy. Um, But I think a lot of people relate to it. So I want to read the post that you said. Uh, You said that just because you aren't stressing out or anxious about a task, job, goal, or project doesn't mean you are doing something wrong. Maybe it means you finally figured out how to do it right. And I just... I, I totally relate to that because I am the type of person that needs to be like busy all the time. If I'm not doing something, I feel like I'm being lazy. I feel like I'm not giving it whatever it is a hundred percent. Um, it, I just constantly need to like, not that I think I need to feel stressed, but maybe I just, I struggle with having downtime and not being stressed. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but she definitely needs that in her life. Like convincing her to sit down and watch a TV show with me, very difficult because all that goes through her mind is what else can I be doing? Like there's a million other things I can be doing to be productive right now rather than spending an hour or two watching a TV show. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, I just really, I really related to that. And I thought (laughs) our, our listeners would, would like to hear because it's, it's so true. It's, I'm not being lazy. I am working as hard. I've, I have maybe figured it out. Maybe I am doing it right. And it doesn't mean that I need to keep piling these things on to, you know, feel busy or that, you know, so I just, I really, I really want to point that out. Thank you for, thank you for bringing that up. I mean, it's really important because we live in a hustle culture and Taylor, male, boy Taylor, yes. you are you like my husband. You've kind of, you've kind of managed to um, balance it. And if I look in my whole family, I've got four, we've got four adult children and they all work for us. And if I look at it, I am the one like you, girl Taylor. I am literally always, I, they literally tell me, okay, you know what? Calm down. So I've had to train myself over the years to see that watching that movie or lying on my balcony, watching the sea and reading a book or just playing with my dogs is as productive Mm. as you know doing it and you don't have to feel this buzz all the time but on the same note there is a level of satisfaction like when I do research it's relaxation Mm -hmm. yeah it's not difficult for me it's as so to tell me to stop doing that so there's that so I want to bring some balance in here to this because uh that's true there's this thing that you've got to do self-care in fact there's some quite funny article about what was it that someone one of my kids sent through a, a a some article about how self-care is almost created rotten bed something or so, so people are like sitting in bed and there's so much there's so much emphasis on self-care yeah. that you feel guilty if you're not doing the the formula meanwhile everyone's got their own unique bio-individuality their brain is different um, we do need to make sure though that we are resting so there's a combination of finding that balance of am i stuck in hustle culture where i feel like unless i'm achieving something i'm wasting time or am i able to evaluate what what does t- time wasting mean? Why is not watching a movie productive? And understanding that and thinking, okay, well, maybe I can watch a movie once or twice a week, but I really love to be reading. It's to work out what works for you, but to be completely honest and evaluate because unfortunately the brain and the conscious mind get very tired. They're like your cell phone. They are going to run out. Mm-hmm. But your non-conscious mind, which most people don't even understand exists, it's not the subconscious. It's not the unconscious. The unconscious is when you're asleep. The subconscious is actually just a portal. It's a doorway between the conscious mind and the non-conscious. The non-conscious is the biggest part of you. It never stops. It's how you build life into your brain. It's how you how it protects, it protects you. It's always looking for things that are blocking and sending signals into the conscious mind it is sorting out things when you're asleep so it's your best friend um and it, it, literally your con- unconscious mind uses things like intrusive thoughts to catch your attention uh, depression anxieties to catch your attention so it's sending messages to you all the time mm-hmm. and what's really important is for us to be honest and open and to look at those messages and say to ourselves is how i'm showing up with the need to do so much that i feel like unless i feel this level of whatever, I'm not satisfied in who I am. If that's really what you need to survive, always to bear in mind that there's only so much energy your brain has. So to make sure that part of that busyness is also some sort of relaxation busyness. So maybe you do need to read a book or you do need to read a research study or you do need to have a certain amount of things filled up in the day. That gives you peace. That's great. But to work out where the balance is and to read the signs of when you're starting to get tired. And one of the classic signs of someone who wants to keep busy all the time, mm-hmm. and that's part of who they are, is a feeling of flatness. So when your brain starts getting flat, you feel flat. And if you've done it like a few days in a row, you may wake up and think, 
okay, I'm actually feeling a little bit depressed and there's no reason for me to feel depressed. That could be that your brain's just really tired and needs a rest mm -hmm. and that you do need to watch that movie, if that makes sense. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, you're going to be making me watch a lot of movies with you now. Do you ever feel flat? Yeah, I think so. That's a really classic um, feeling because the kind of, um, I mean, I, that's how I tell when I, that's, that's the way that I can judge when I know like, okay, I'm feeling flat. I've overdone it. I'm overexcited. I'm over hyper, you yeah. know, those energizer bunny things. It's time for me to deliberately and intentionally go and have a sauna, go for a longer walk, lie on the balcony, literally yeah. force myself. Yeah. Even if I'm still reading a research paper, I'm lying on the balcony as opposed to sitting at my desk or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So that's a I think that's all good things. Yeah, that's a great thing to implement. All right. Well, we're watching a movie tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So you've, um, you've written quite a few books, and I wanted to dive into a couple of them. So first, in your book, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess, you go over five simple, scientifically proven steps to help reduce anxiety, stress, and toxic, toxic thinking. Could you give us and our listeners a little sneak peek of what these steps are, because I would personally love to help uh, start incorporating them. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So the whole psychoneurobiological network thing I spoke about yeah. and mind management and all that stuff, the five steps are how you make the psychoneurobiological network work the way you want it to work. So your, psych your mind brain body connection you can drive it in the right direction with the five steps. So it's the tool. It's the system of how you make your brain rewire itself in the way that it should. Take that energy that's toxic and take those protein. Because thoughts, experiences like this discussion now, isn't just words. It's actual electromagnetic light forces and, and, all kind of, and auditory sound waves and quantum waves. And it actually goes in your brain and your brain then responds and builds proteins out of this information. And... This, so this conversation, for example, is growing into a tree-like structure, which is a thought. And everything we talk about is all the little memories. So you grow trees in your brain. So by the time we, at this stage in, in, in our lives, we've all got trillions of trees because we've had trillions of experiences. So the good, the bad, the ugly are all built into your brain networks as these trees. And they never go away. They can just get changed. So once mm. they're there, they're there. That's it but you can change them. So if, they, if it's a toxic experience, think of an ugly looking tree. And if it's a healthy experience, think of a healthy tree. That's a really easy way to understand yeah. it. And not only is it a tree in your brain, but it's also a change in every cell that you have. And we have about 37 to 100 trillion cells. And those cells, are the, the, the memory is going to those cells as well. And that also goes into your mind as it, like a field. So we've got to deal with all of that this field, this trees, these changes in our cells. So just saying I want to change or just doing a breathing or meditation exercise or just doing positive affirmations, none of those are wrong. They're all important and they all achieve a goal. But what I found from my research is that, and my clinical application and so on, is that you've got to put, you've got to follow a sequence to get things from the mind into the brain and into the body, there's a sequence that the brain actually goes, the mind, not just the brain, the mind, brain, and body, they separate. The brain's physical, the mind makes the brain work. It's that energy. Um, so there's a, there's a root, and those five steps have grown out of that. So the five steps are called the neurocycle, which I mentioned earlier on, which is in an app form. So the yeah. app is like literally me walking you through the five steps in a sort of therapeutic sense. And you can also use it in the moment. So the neurocycle is five steps for dealing with big stuff like trauma, dealing with um, middle road of this middle of the road stuff like patterns that are maybe disrupting a relationship or something and then the day-to-day -day stuff like irritating irritating traffic or an irritating email stuff that's not so big so yeah. you can use the, the nearest the five steps in 30 seconds in the midst of an argument to calm things down if there's a big pattern in your life you would use the neurocycle daily for about 5 to 15 maximum 45 minutes over cycles of 63 days which is the time it takes to rewire the networks so that's what what the thing does it's it's the tool of how to change the, the networks and why do we need to change the networks because those networks are producing you how you show up everything you do every moment of every day is not just happening randomly it's attached to the networks in these in the in the psychoneurobiological field and therefore, if I want to change how I'm showing up in certain circumstances, in other words, if I'm feeling very depressed or very triggered or very anxious or having panic attacks, that's 
what is that related to? It's there's some reason behind behind that. That is coming from those signals are coming from from the network. Okay, uh, from, that you've built. So you by using the five steps, you learn to observe how you show up, and then you reverse engineer to find the thought that it's attached to in your brain, mm. which has got all these memories, and then you can break that down, go to the root, which is the origin story. Where did it, this thing come from in the first place? So the branches are kind of how you're showing up and then the roots are where it comes from. And then you can't ever get rid of the tree, but what you can do is heal the roots. And then do, that then grows, the tree turns from an ugly tree into a pretty tree. I mean, that's like so simple, yeah. but that's what you're doing. When that happens, then your body responds. So that's kind of the the behind it. So do you want me to explain what the five steps are? I'll give you a brief overview of what they are. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I'd love to know. Okay, so the five steps are called the gather awareness, the active, the gather awareness, reflect, write, recheck, active reach. Each word is deliberately chosen, and as you're doing it, all this fantastic brain stuff is happening. So it's like a lot of stuff happening. And I've got charts in the book if you want to go into the detail in the children's book, which is how to help your child clean up their mental mess, which is mm -hmm. releasing. In August, um, that's got all this in very simple language. So a lot of the adults love this because it's all pictures and there's a little oh, yeah. character called Brainy that walks you. We've got this little character called Brainy that Brainy. walks you through the whole is your mental health, the mental health journey. And we'll send you, oh, we'll gosh. send you a Brainy in the so book cute. and whatever. Anyway, so the cartoons are a great way for kids to relate to, but it's the same concept. You can teach a child as young as two how to do these five steps. You just got to do it slightly differently. Okay, so this is what you do. The first, just before you start the five steps, you need to prepare your brain because your brain um, and your brain and your body and your mind, you've got to prepare the, the, the psycho neurobiological network because the chemicals are flying like crazy, the energy's gone crazy, there's chaos. Depending on, and it may be a little chaos or big chaos, it's messy. So if we're going to do some work of changing stuff, of trying to find out and change something in our life, we have to calm down the brain first. So you do a bit of brain preparation, and that could be anything from breathing, meditation, awareness, whatever, anything in that region. Um, it could be something as simple as if you're very worked up or you're trying to just get your mind calm, you could think of five things I can see, three, four things I can smell, but three things I can, you know, things like that. So it's all, there's a million techniques out there that fall in under the brain preparation to um, cap a sort of area. And that you, that's not enough though to start to, to finish. That just starts the process. A lot of people only do that. And it's like a bandaid, you know, on their own, they do not work. They put long-term, they don't create long-term change. You can keep using them, but it doesn't solve the problem, but you need them to get the brain under control. Right. So you need them plus. Yeah. So the neurocycle is the plus. And, the, and so therefore, once you prepare the brain, then you're going to gather awareness. Now gather, note the word gather. Gather means that I'm in control. I'm selecting, I'm choosing. So you go to choose what you want to focus on in the moment. So it's not all over the place and chaotic. It's very focused. And it's and you you gather awareness of four signals. So that we show up as a collective in four signals. So all the way we in a combat, let's say that you have a, have a, a an argument with someone, the way you're showing up in that moment, you're going to have emotions, you're going to have a response in your body, you're going to have behaviors, how you're speaking, what you're saying, what you're doing, and you're going to have a perspective in that moment. So angry, um it's all good. It, tense shoulders, um, irritated speech, and um, I hate this person or whatever. I mean, I've just said stupid stuff, but it's stuff that gives you the idea. So you gather awareness. Now, that simple thing of just labeling in four sentences starts to change the networks. It brings stuff into the conscious mind, and it makes the trees weak and malleable. So now I can change it. It also makes us aware of stuff we weren't aware of. And so we can start breaking patterns and so on and, and breaking responses that were maybe trauma responses for coping and stuff like that. So it's, it brings into awareness and it's very focused. Then you immediately go into reflect and reflect is why do I have this emotion? What other emotions I have? And why is it showing up like this in my body? And where, when, what, why, how? So it's like shining a light through a prism. A white light becomes a rainbow when it comes out the other side. So the reflect is taking those four things you gathered awareness of, which are four little sentences and and doing the why stuff then you've got to write that down and i'm not talking journaling i'm talking literally throw it on a page the mm. messier the better all over the page colors pictures arrows circles whatever you want and whatever comes to your mind because at this stage you've opened up the networks and you've opened up 
access to the non-conscious mind, you know, in, and that's where all of our networks are stored. And it's kind of like the, I'm sure you've seen the, the big redwoods in San Francisco, the root systems. Mm. That's what our networks look like. They connect it. So once I pull up one, associated thoughts will be pulled up. So sometimes yeah. there's a whole bunch of associations. Okay, so you get the idea. So the writing starts pulling that up and giving you insight. And what's really important about that stage is to just get it all on a piece of paper and not to worry about, oh, what does the system make sense? Just yeah. get it down. Then in yeah. the fourth step, you go back and you look and make sense of the whole situation. What are the patterns? What are the triggers? How can I reconceptualize this? Look at it to another lens. This has happened. What can I do? And then you close the cycle because your mind, brain, body network works in cycles. So the first four steps have taken you in a cycle like this, now we need to close the cycle. So the active reach closes the cycle and then another one will start. Mm. And the active reach is a little action that you can do, simple thing, like it could be just a statement, a positive affirmation, a little visualization technique. It could be anything related to the work that you've just done and uh, and whatever. So now let me talk through this very fast. Let's say that you're in an argument, in a meeting, and someone says something that really triggers you. And you can feel yourself about to explode. Yeah. So you can quickly do a neurocycle. So you can quickly, in your mind, in like 10 seconds, I'm, I'm angry, I'm going to explode. Notice this, I'm angry, emotion. I'm going to explode, behavior. Um, my, I've got immediate fluttering of my heart. I'm getting like, and then my perspective, this has gone on too long. Quickly say that, why? Okay, there's a situation here. This is happening too often. I can't. This has got to be dealt with. It's impacting. Just quickly in your head, just give yourself the reason why. Mm -hmm. So you're validating yourself. You're allowing yourself to be messy. You're not denying. You're not whatever. Then mm -hmm. you may not be able to write it down. Maybe you can. Maybe you have time to write it down. Pretend you're taking notes in the meeting. But maybe you don't. So if you don't have time to write, you just visualize. As though you're taking a movie through your iPhone camera, you know, to do, to your, on your phone. Just like yeah. you've first video and new video and what you do is you kind of fly above your head in your mind it's called the multiple perspective advantage and you watch yourself in that situation mm -hmm. you watch the other person you watch yourself and you listen you observe so you've distanced and you observe and that helps you kind of get all of the situation out so when you're writing or observing you're getting it out and that pulls things up and starts showing you then you're going to go into the quick recheck okay i see that this is happening this person's losing and they're cool but let, it, it often shifts you into empathy where you think okay well maybe they, they're showing up like that because there's something that they whatever so you start seeing the other perspective that that is very powerful it starts showing you another a bigger bird's eye view of the situation so your recheck is okay well i can't explode now i feel much calmer just having done those you feel calmer mm -hmm. that person's saying that ridiculous thing i don't agree with the word they said but they've got a reason mm -hmm. so let me try and get that reason out of them so that i can reason with them or whatever and we can solve this problem so that's kind of a recheck and then the active reach you calmly say to them is this what you mean and you maybe repeat back what they said to them to reflect back to them what they said and then they can say oh no i didn't actually mean it that way or whatever and hmm. you can actually move forward now that can happen in 10 10 20 seconds and can turn a potentially explosive situation into into something that actually can be taken to the next level to analyze what a better solution is or whatever wow. so that's an example of in the moment yeah but if you're doing this over time if it's a big trauma that you're dealing with so there's a and how do we recognize a big trauma changes in our patterns or consistent patterns that are disruptive whether it's in a relationship or at work or just in how you feel about yourself if there's a lot of negative self-talk and that's a pattern mm -hmm. there's a there's a reason and then you would have to do the neurocycle daily in this planned and guided way over time to pull all of that up and change because habits don't form in a day yeah. they form in cycles of 63 days so that's the basic principle so cool yeah i want to like learn how to do that <laughs> Start, you wanting to learn no way start if i know i have a problem i like i learn. love it you i like learning no, this is great i love it <laughs> but, when, but when you start doing it it's unreal i've done this for years now obviously because i developed the system years ago and proved and whatever but I, I use it daily and i'm always doing like when i get up in the morning that's what i'll do a neurocycle to get me into that frame of mind and check if i'm not complaining or something because the way you wake up sets the tone for the day so you mm -hmm. can quickly get yourself under control and while i'm getting ready i'll work on if there's a pattern in my life in a situation like if i get thrown and i react i can get myself back under control so i don't have it all together but and i still lose it and get frustrated and still get upset but it, i don't stay like that for longer it's like this would happen before and i'd get stuck now things happen i get thrown but i get back up quickly so yeah. my resilience has changed and that's what i found with my patience and whatever over the years so it's a life skill. This is not a new therapy technique or a, a new self-care thing. It's basically a life skill. 
Yeah. Your mind drives everything. So if you don't manage your mind, all those self-care and whatever, yeah. everything else you do isn't going to be functioning at the level it should. So your mm. mind, because your mind drives everything. Yeah. Wow. wow. That's so awesome. Um, I want to stick on your new book that at this time is not out, but by the time this episode comes out, it will be released. So congrats on the new book. Um, we're so super, much. super excited for you. Need a little brainy. A little brainy guy over oh. here. I know, it's so cute. We'll make sure you get a brainy. It's very cute. I love, I love the little brainy. <laughs> so cute. Um, but I, I do want to know on the note of your new book. Uh, I mean, we, I think we kind of touched on it, so maybe this is the answer. But if not, I would love to know um, about, like, how do our mental messes, messes from our childhood follow us into, like, adolescence and adulthood? Is that kind of what you were saying with the trees? Is that how they're... They follow yes, us because exactly. they're there. Excellent question. Anything that we've experienced is influencing how we show up. So all our collective experiences are influenced. That's logical. We all know that. But it's, this is real now. It's actually real trees inside your brain. So if it's a toxic tree, um, it is influencing how you show up. Now, anything that's toxic is um, because it's not normal to be abused or not normal to be bullied or whatever, unless it's processed that we, we we develop coping mechanisms. So you can almost think of the branch, the roots as the experience and then the branches of how we interpret that experience and how we cope. And then collectively that tree works with the mind and the body. And here you are in life, at school, at work, in relationships, et cetera. So that never goes away until we do something about it. And that's that explosive thing that I explained earlier on about that one client who, I mean, the one person in the study who had that extensive childhood yeah. trauma and so on. So um, it, it carries through in that whatever you think about the most will grow. Whatever is unmanaged or undealt with, the tree in the forest, think of it like this. A tree that's in a forest, if it's planted in the soil, it's still getting nutrition. It's not going away until you actually do something to the tree, maybe chop it down or um, change the, you know, feel heal because you don't want to chop down trees. So we're going to, and you can't in your brain, they, they never get chopped down. They'll just grow back up again. Right. So you might yeah. chop it down. They're going to just, they just pop straight up again. They're even more toxic than before. So we have to go to the source and we have to heal the nutrition, the, the, the roots and things like that. So mm. in a, in childhood trauma, that, but that is undealt with. We've got that toxic tree that unfortunately is growing. It's organic, it's dynamic. It's not just stuck in one in time. And that's why we, we hear so much about people going back to do the, you know, going back to the inner child because someone who's, for example, been abused or in any way, whether it's sexual or physical, or if it's a short period or long period at any stage in, in our formative years and, and, and as adults, um, that is organically growing. You may not be consciously aware, but you're in a situation where there's a similar smell or a similar sound or a similar looking person or a statement or a movie, and it gets triggered. Yeah. And every time it gets triggered, it grows a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And eventually it's so big it, it, that you can even, it can get so big that we can look at life through just that tree. So here I've got a forest of a trillion trees, but I am stuck in this part of the forest that's toxic. And that then influences. So there's a story in, in the book of someone that I had never actually met until I had actually written, was almost finished writing this book. And it was someone who um, uh, got on my research team and was uh, was a part, it was new on the research team. Yeah. Unbeknown to me, they had discovered the NeuroCycle app and were using it. Now, this is just very quickly backtrack. This is a stepmom of a child who was, who, and when she married her husband, it was his child from his first wife. And that child, uh, the, he left her immediately, whatever. There was no, it wasn't a good relationship. She wasn't a great mom, but he didn't realize how bad she was. And so basically the child was physically abused from, physically and sexually abused from the age of three months. I mean, it's horrific. Uh -huh. It's a terrible trauma. And man, they only realized um, a couple of years into that child's life that what was happening. And it took them another whole year to get the child away from that mother because of body, social services and whatever. Uh -huh. Long story short, they got the child. But now that child was manifesting with all kinds of behavioral problems yeah. and uh, illnesses. And I mean, this child, by the time the child was eight, this child had every label under the sun from autism to bipolar to Everything really? you could possibly give someone, this child had wow. at eight. And they were, you know, they were literally forcing them to put the child on medication because that's what the current system says. If you don't do it, you the schools will report you. And so they were really in a tight place. Hmm. Anyway, long story, very, very the story is is ends up very happily. The pair, the mom it, is a researcher, is a um, was 
got to, was working for a company that works with me on my research team and happened to be part of the detail on one of our um, studies, started using the, uh, the, the neuro cycle and to help herself just cope because the situation was terrible. The child wouldn't sleep at night. They couldn't go anywhere. They couldn't do anything. The child would sleep less than four hours at night. They'd wake up every oh. couple of hours at night. And it's just because of everything that had been happening. Oh. Impossible at school. They had to homeschool. She was falling apart. And essentially, she then used the neuro cycle and started changing it. So this child that she was homeschooling and trying to work saw her change. And, it, and this is key. If you're going to help your child, and that's really the principle operating here, in order to help our children with, through this mental health crisis that we're in, we have to teach them mind management, not more yeah. medication, not more drugs. This child saw the mom change and said, I want to do that. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. And I didn't have the children's version out yet. She just adapted it down and the child did it with her. Within four days, this child was sleeping through the night. And there's interviews and things that I did, which I put into the book. But it was such a, I could put a, there was a thousand stories I could have put in this book. But I put this one in because it's so dramatic in terms of this trauma, childhood trauma. Yeah. that persisted from three months through to eight. The child's now um, almost nine and a half. And has uh, this, the difference is phenomenal. The child's at school coping still has issues i mean who doesn't yeah, yeah. and there's still going to be stuff that carries through but there, as something comes up this child will turn around and say okay i needed I, I i know what to do and this child will tell you i mean it's unreal the kinds of comments that, that, that when i interviewed him he was eight and a half yeah. uh, that, that the sort of things that he would say that once he knew how to do the neurocycle he said if i'm feeling bad if i miss one day I'm, I'm, I go do my neurocycle and it helps me. And you'll draw pictures like, I don't, I don't want to have nightmares tonight. And here's my picture of a, of a nice dream. And there's a house with a chimney that's got parts coming out of it versus a, a little chimney that's got black smoke coming out of it. And he said, I go to bed and that's my active reach. I go to sleep thinking I'm going to dream the heart. I'm going to have mm. the hearts coming out of it. I mean, kids are brilliant in how they... Yeah. how they talk about it. Yesterday I was speaking to a 16-year-old that I didn't even know was doing my neurocycle, but someone that was, it's a group of athletes that we're going to be working with and the daughter was battling and uh, sort of using the neurocycle and it transformed her life. So, I mean, I'm not I'm not trying to push my stuff, really. It's mm -hmm. not it's not the neurocycle. It's the, the neurocycle is the system. It works. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we, I don't practice anymore. Why we don't, we put in something for ninety nine dollars for a whole year. You can get on the app. The book is. If I don't hide, keep anything back. I give every skill possible that you can be empowered to help your child and not break the bank in the process. Yeah. But it's it's we it's it's our right. It's our human right to understand mm -hmm. how to deal with that stuff that has happened to us and to help us feel like we've got an identity again that we have value, and that I can do it. I don't have to rely just on the external. I can actually learn how to do it myself and I'm not broken, you know, that I'm um, not forever broken, you know, that kind of concept. Yeah. That's wow. true. I get so passionate about this because I've just seen such transformation and this is why, you know, this is really why I do what I do. Yeah. No, oh, I was like, push it all you want because it's clearly, it's clearly worked for a lot of people. And it's so cool that it's been able to help so many people. Were you going to say something? No, I was just going to say that it's unbelievable. And um, yeah, the power of the brain is unbelievable. And uh, those example stories are just yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, they really are. Very uh, eye-opening. Yeah. Uh, last question what? before we let you go. Um, I would love to know what, I mean, you, you can answer this however you want, but what do you think is maybe wrong with how we're currently treating depression, anxiety, and other mental health issues in children today? Thank you for asking that question. And, and my answer applies to children, but it also applies to adults. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the the short end of the of this of the sort of the clip notes version is that things shifted around about the way we deal with mental health shifted dramatically around about 40 years ago, 40, 45 years ago, when mm -hmm. they discovered the first medication to give to people that were really out of control and it sort of it calmed them down. So a whole industry of medic of drugs for helping control mental health developed at the same time the psychiatric guild was very um threatened because they weren't seen as real doctors so it was now a thing of oh, okay cardiovascular surgeons have got a heart we could we've got the brain we can now medicate and whatever so it, it, it there was a lot of that kind of thing going on yeah. and that combination is a very powerful combination that then pushed in um, the concept of mental health into the world of um, the biomedical model so it's kind of what I said in the beginning. You can't just, if someone has, a, like the story of the child I just told. Yeah. 
if, if you, what happened with that child is that the symptoms were the only thing that were, you know, it was the symptom that was the focus and elimination of the symptom. This child's showing these um, behaviors. Let's eliminate those behaviors through a diagnosis and a medication. And yes, there was bits of therapy, but the therapy was around that sort of focus. So that shift from looking at the whole person in their circumstance and understanding that anxiety, depression are not illnesses, but are emotional warning signals that are very normal responses to adverse circumstances. That focus shifted to, uh, uh, that's not what we're looking at here. We're going to treat it like diabetes type one, which we know is a problem with the pancreas. You can do tests, you can diagnose, you can track it back to the underlying biological cause, and you can aim a medication at that. That's a medication. It's identify, it's, it's trying to help with the lack of insulin. So yeah. it makes sense. But when it comes to that child's story, that's not a chemical imbalance that that child has that you can fix with a drug. That's not a um, a drug-related problem. That's not a brain-related problem. Although the brain has been damaged because the mind uses the brain and that toxic, constantly having those toxic trees in the brain will affect the telomeres and the hormones and the stress system and physically weaken the biological age of the body. So therefore, illnesses will develop, which this child had, which people, which that case study I gave earlier on in my clinical trial they had physical problems so that's very normal to have for the physical sicknesses but that's not the cause that's the result because mm. if you can constantly take a computer and throw it on the floor it's not going to work properly so that's the principle operating here yeah um, and so essentially what we need to what we what that shift then led to um the situation of instead of looking at the whole picture diagnosing symptoms and if you do that you're going to land up with a crisis now, here's the question very quickly to summarize this. If that system worked, wouldn't things be better today than they were? 40 years on, we're sitting with a problem that was picked up in the early 90s yeah. and that in between 2014 and 2015, a huge studies were done over a long time from 96 to 2014 and multiple studies globally that, that the federal data that was released on the study showed that people are dying 18 to 25 years, 8 to 25 years younger than they should from preventable lifestyle diseases. Mm. That there's these things called deaths of despair. In other words, there's a bunch of stats and statistics and research saying that hey, the billions of dollars that we've thrown at this approach to just diagnose and medicate and try and say it's all brain-related yeah. is not working. Not doing anything. But it's still being done. It's still yeah. being done. Mm -hmm. And and that's the – so the, 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 there's been global surveys done on mental health that we do these global surveys. And generally, adults come out worse than kids. But the last couple of years, kids have come out worse than adults. So mm -hmm. this drug focus, not allowing a child to be – pathologizing childhood, medicalizing yeah. misery has been the result. And then that leads to this increase in mental health crisis. So I don't believe it's a mental health crisis. Yeah. I believe it's a mind management crisis. Mm. So if we can bring mind management back again, we can we can shift things. Yeah. Does that make sense? It's a complicated answer, but does it does it make sense? Or I can try and simplify. No. It made pretty good sense to me. Yeah. No, that made complete sense. Yeah, that was good. Woo. Good. <laughs> Carolyn, thank you so much for being with us today. That was um that was awesome. I, I learned so much and I, I hope everybody listening did too. But we we're really honored to have you and just thank you for your time and everything can't wait to you read do. the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go oh, get the book. Of course. I'm I'm honored and thank you for your great questions. It was a lovely discussion. And I'll make sure you get a brain. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Oh my you. gosh. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Lots of insight there. Yes, lots of insight. Such we great loved insight. that chat. Learned so much um, from her and just very thankful to have her on with us. Um, thank you, Dr. Carolyn. Yes. For coming on. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in and listening. Yes. Um, what Anything else you want to say before we let our lemon drops go for the rest of the week? You know, we have our lautner.thisqueezepodcast at gmail.com. Uh, where you guys can, you know, send in questions, comments, concerns, anything. We have our segment Tea Time with Tay. Um, we want to start integrating like an advice column segment type thing. Yeah. Um, so if you guys need advice on anything that we could maybe help you out with, obviously we do not um, have any medical advice to give. Just want to put that little disclaimer out there. Yeah. Um, but for one of our one of our next upcoming solo episodes. Yeah. We want to do kind of like an advice section. Because that sounds fun. It doesn't and a lot even of have you. to be serious. I mean, it can be, but yeah. it also can just be like something funny too. And yeah. 
we'll we'll pull a few of the uh, questions. Yeah, we've both definitely been through a lot of a lot of life, but a lot of different life experiences. Um, growing up and being now together, going through stuff. So, yeah, yeah, I'd like to think we have some kind of fun outlooks on things. Okay. Yeah. So that's all. You know where to find us on the socials. If not, you can click down below. You guys have an amazing rest of your Wednesday. We will see you next week. And we are so thankful that you are here. Adios, guys. This podcast has been brought to you by Podcast Nation.